Welcome again. We start with the second lecture on nanomicrotechnology. Last week we started to discuss lithography and at the end of the lecture I explained to you the calculation and how to calculate resolution. And the issue is that we have a mask and a lens and a wafer and we project the lens over the wafer. The resolution is defined or is calculated based on, lean, on uh, Rayleigh uh, geometrical optics theorem as proportional to the wavelengths, inverse, inversely proportional to the numerical aperture, and k is a factor which is about 0.5, about 0.5, and I explained it to you last week. k can be actually better than theory. If you look at the numbers, uh, typical lithography uh, about 10 years ago, people used the mercury arc lamp with a wavelength of 365 nanometers, numerical aperture of 0.45. This is typical numbers about 10 years ago. And the resolution was about half a micron. Today, people use much shorter wavelength and a much larger numerical aperture, and the resolution is 193 nanometer. However, we know that 193 nanometer, 193 is much bigger than what we can produce today. Actually, we produce today 45 nanometers. So I will tell you how we actually overcome the problem, how we make the resolution better. What I uh, showed you last time, there are two, two uh, if you want to solve a problem, there are two method. First, understand it and try to overcome it. Second, find a trick. Find something that is kind of revolutionary. One idea which people use it, I think most of the people which are trying to achieve better resolution use is what's called off-axis illumination. You don't illuminate in perpendicular to the mask, you illuminate in an angle. So if you illuminate in an angle, you find out that if there is the zero order diffraction, uh, uh, the, first or, the zero order diffraction and the first order, your mask will capture the first order, but only half of it. But it will capture the information, so we get better resolution. So off-axis illumination is very popular, and let's go on and discuss some other problems, but resolution is a problem because we want to get better resolution, but we actually have a big problem which is life is more complicated. All the calculations that I, that I uh, showed you before are related to flat surfaces, which means I generate the image directly on this flat surface. But if you look at the surface of a wafer, for example, this is a, where you make a transistor, this is the field oxide. When you make a transistor, you take a silicon substrate, and next to the substrate you grow an oxide. And the reason you grow this oxide because you have one transistor, and the next transistor next to it, and you want to isolate between them. So this field oxide is an isolation between the regions. And about 10 years ago, up to about 10 years ago, it was very common that when you oxidize silicon, you take silicon, react it with oxygen, so for one molecule of silicon, you generate one molecule of SiO2, but you incorporate oxygen, so the oxide thickness is bigger. You take one volume of silicon, you generate two volumes of oxide. So when you oxidize this region, eventually you consume this region of silicon, but the oxide thickness is much thicker. So what you get is a surface which is non-planar. It's not flat. This area is flat, this area is flat, but this area is higher than this. So if you take the mask, and let's go back, you're projecting the image of the mask on the wafer. Should you project it here, or should you project it here? You, ideally, you would like to have something that we call big depth of focus, which means you project it here, or here, or here, and you will be in focus. All of you which 
you know, taking pictures in cameras, you know what does it mean to be out of focus. If I can take a picture of you, it's possible that people behind you will be out of focus. So how to make everything in focus and still keep the resolution? This is one option. Second is forget it. Let's planarize everything. So about 10 years ago, people started during process in nanolithography and microlithography not to print on surface which is textured. Try to planarize the surface. So planarization became a major issue, major, a major factor in manufacturing. And in about lecture number six or seven, I don't remember the exact number, we'll talk about planarization, about how do we planarize. So let's talk a little bit about depth of focus. You take the image, you project it through the lens, and the focus is here. But let's say you have a region where you are still, if you take a picture here or take the image here, you still be in focus. And we call this regime depth of focus. The, it can be shown, I'm not going to give you the full proof. The full proof is quite complicated. And it's even more complicated because this proof, the simple proof, is for coherent light. But I'm going to discuss it later, and I'll show you a little bit more in more details, that the light that we use in real life is not fully coherent, but it's not incoherent. We call it partially coherent light. And I'm going to explain to you why in real life we don't use fully coherent light. But even if you... Either you use coherent light or non-coherent light or partially coherent light, the depth of focus is proportional to the wavelength. Of course, the shorter the wavelength, the better the focus. However, it's inversely proportional to the numerical aperture square. And there is a magic number, K2, kind of a fudge factor, which is, <laughs> accidentally, it's also about half. Also about 0.5. So this is a number for depth and focus. So we have two numbers. We have one number is the resolution, which is k lambda over, over numerical aperture. And the second number is k lambda over numerical aperture square. And this is a paradox. If I want good resolution, I reduce lambda. If I want good resolution, if I want good depth of focus, I have to increase lambda. Because I would like to have a large depth of focus. So the demand for depth of focus is contradicting the demand for resolution. Second, if I want good resolution, I make numerical aperture larger. Because larger numerical aperture is a better resolution. But larger numerical aperture is low depth of focus. So you can see that the requirement for good resolution are contradicting the need for large depth of focus. The fact of life is that modern cameras, mod modern lithography tools have very high resolution and very, very limited depth of focus. And we have to live with it. This is it. But we have to understand it. We have to know the limitations. Because as an engineer, when you design a process, you need to know what is the fluctuations in the thickness, how much photoresistor you're allowed to put, and what are the details of the process. For example, in the next graph, if I take the two equations, and I can play games. For example, I can take fixed depth of focus. I can assume that DOF is fixed, which means lambda over numerical aperture square is fixed. So if I take depth of focus fixed equal to 1, and this is for a, actually this is for a wavelength, uh, 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 and, and then calculate the resolution. I will find out that as a function of numerical aperture, like if I take a numerical aperture 0.4, the best resolution will be 0.3. I cannot get better than this. So if I want to get a resolution of 0.2, I need to have a depth of focus based on this wavelength it should be zero, which is completely unpractical, which means for this specific example, I somehow I have to reduce the wavelengths to get what I need. As an in, when we design a, a lithography system, 
we have first to ask ourselves how much depth of focus is allowed, and second, what is the resolution that I need to achieve for the process. And the two values are contradicting, and in some situations there is no solution, which means it's impossible. But the rule of thumb is that if you want good resolution, if you can have zero depth of focus, which means completely flat surface, then it's a good starting point. And as you can see, that the, uh, if you go to low numerical aperture, uh, basically you get a bad resolution, even when if, if you have a zero depth of focus, still you have bad resolution. So this is what we call depth of focus and practical resolution. And this is the trade-off. And this is the same equation again, but here I added another calculation. It's a similar, this figure is similar to the previous one, but here I calculate the resolution for practical system, I-line and DUV. I-line is a very common system that people use since uh, about 20 years ago. It's still very common in manufacturing. I-line is the line of the, the spectral line of mercury. People use mercury lamps and this is a, a very specific wavelength for mercury. It's a very common lamp, it's, very, it's kind of a workhorse of the industry for low resolution. If you want to print in low resolution, this is very common. In many cases, even when you do nanolithography and you, pr and you print very narrow lines, you still need the frame around it, you still need some pads to touch. So even if you do you are working with nanotechnology, in many cases you still need the lithography to produce the devices around your nanostructures. So for example, with the eye line, if you go to resolution of 365 nanometer, your depth of focus is, will be half a micron, 5 or 7 nanometers. What does it mean? It means that you allow yourself on your sample to go plus quarter micron, minus quarter micron, so the total deviation from the optical focus or the ideal focus will be half a micron and still get your best resolution. However, if you go to 193 nanometer and get a resolution below quarter micron, about 193 nanometer, your depth of focus will be also about quarter micron, which means you're allowed only quarter micron to be off the ideal focus. Overall. 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 This is delta, is the total depth of focus. Now, let's, so this is the theory. Now let's talk a little bit about practice. What you see in, if you go, if you go to a company or if you go to our lab, lab, and what do you see? You see machines which are used to project this is the mask, sorry, this is a, the, the very, sorry, the very, very big mercury arc lamp, a mirror, and this is very similar to car lamps, just bigger, and the, the lamp here typically is one to two kilowatt, it's a very big lamp. Underneath you put a filter, you want to filter wavelength that you don't use, then you put un, under it, you put the mask, there is some, of course, there is a lens system, and this lens is a very complicated system, but generally what it does, it collects the light from the source, and the light is propagating in all directions. Typically, it's called a telecentric lens. A telecentric lens is a lens that collects the light from all directions and generates a parallel beam. We call this type of lens telecentric, uh, telecentric lens. And this lens is projected through the mask, and you put the lens, the uh, re reduction lens, the objective lens, we put it here. Why we put it here? Because typically we want to reduce the size. We want the mask to be much bigger than the image here. This is typical reduction camera. And because it's a reduction camera, we can make the mask on a very relaxed design rules. Like if I want to print here, one micron on the mask, it will be typical reduction cameras are 4 to 1, 5 to 1. There's some machine 10 to 1, but this is the most that I know. 
So for every micron here, it will be 5 micron on the mask. So if there is a defect, which is 1 micron on the mask, this defect will be projected to be only one-fifth of the defect. So this is one good way to overcome defects. And actually, when these machines were introduced about mid-80s, about 25 years ago, suddenly, if you look at the graph of the productivity of the industry, it jumped. Because people 30 years ago had big problems with the masks. But once you introduce these machines, all the problems disappeared and the suddenly you can introduce many more chips with good qualities and this machine is also called step and repeat because what you do you move the wafer under shoot one picture move the wafer shoot one picture move and shoot and this is why these machines are called step and repeat and if you look this is kind of a cross section if you look from the side this is how it looks the illuminator this is a better image of the lens. Typical lens are not single lens. They are typically 10, 12, 12, 15 elements. It looks more like this structure and you project the image on one square or, or a rectangle. So this is how we do lithography in a step, in a step and repeat in a lens, and it's called a lens-based step. So a refractive system based on step and repeat steppers, lens reduces the image typically 4 and 5, and it permits alignment for each exposure. Now, what does it mean alignment? Let's say I make the first line. This will be the gate of the device. Next, I will somehow have to print the contact. So I need to pull out, take away the mask of the transistor and put here the mask for the contact. But I need the contact to be in the right place. Now, because we use optics, we can actually look from the top or introduce some elements here to observe the image and make uh, what you call a automatic alignment or manual alignment. In the past, people use uh, alignment with eyes. Today, people use automatic alignment using pattern recognition. You move the step. You, there's an automatic camera. The camera, which automatically takes the image, and align the wafer to be in the right place, then takes the shot. Move, align, shot. Move, align, shot. This is how it works. Other types of printers, uh, which are also very common uh, for other reasons, is what we call projection printers. And the projection printers are printers which are using a uh, not refractive optics, not lens, they use partly mirrors. And they were very common 20 years ago, people now use them less and less. They have, a, they have some very big advantage, they can run very quickly. They can print good quality images at relatively high speed. Uh, however, they commonly use a one-to-one -one mask. So the way it works, if you look at the, uh, let's go in this side. If you put, this is your mask. The mask has the elements. You are scanning kind of a element of the mask. And the image is going through, through this. Sorry, this is the scanner. You illuminate it. You illuminate, you illuminate a part of it. And this illumination looks like this. You illuminate this mask. You, so you, the image of this part that you illuminate goes through the mirror to this mirror, going here, 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 and then it goes back to your wafer. And the advantage of this system is that the mask is here, the wafer is here, so the wafer does not touch the mask. So you can keep the mask in ideally clean conditions. Second, you don't need lens, you just use mirrors and it's simpler to produce them with good quality. So this was a very, very common system, which also can run very, very quickly, because if the mask is, wafer is here and the mask is here, you can use a very strong illuminator, and this illuminator show, illuminates very small regions, so you can use very strong illuminators, very, high, very concentrated light. The disadvantage of this system is that you're using a one-to-one -one mask, so it's, it's this is not a mask aligner. No. This is a projection aligner. And, uh, the 
you can get very good resolution here. However, there is an ad, another problem with this system, is that if the, somehow the mirror is not ideal, you start to get scattering. If you remember, Rayleigh's law for scattering, scattering of light is proportional to one of the wavelengths to the power of four. Which means if you, if you reduce the wavelength by a factor of two, the scattering increases by a factor of 16. Which means to use it for very, very short wavelength, we need extremely good quality lens. Uh, there are some new machines using this technique which are more sophisticated than this, but the concept here of the projection aligner, you are limited by, uh, uh, I'm not using lens, um, the other advantage of the system is that if you calculate the numerical aperture of the system, you get a very large number. The numerical aperture, the effective numerical aperture, I did not explain it to you, I showed you only, only the numerical aperture for lens. I did not explain to you about reflective optics, but reflective optics also has, have numerical aperture. In this system, we get a very relatively large numerical aperture, which means we can get reasonable resolution, but uh, there's a big problem of scattering, also a big problem of synchronization, because we need, um, uh, for example, we need to move this illuminator, so we have moving parts, there are some problems, but this was a workhorse for many, many years in many companies, and people still use it. I write here, not for high resolution, and tight overlay. It's very difficult to do alignment in this mask, because you don't see one-to-one -one the mask and the lens. You have to trust some other alignment, which is a big problem for very high resolution. But you can see this machine for many applications, like in packaging, or if you have layers, which you don't need the high resolution. Questions? Why would you need a set of lens and not a set of mirrors and not just not, not lens? No, no. You showed that there are a set of mirrors here. So Mir of them is not just one or two. Ah, this is just schematics. Actually, it's more com actually it's much more complicated. <laughs> this is just schematics. So by, by having more mirrors, what you get? Um, actually, you don't want many mirrors. Uh, this type of, uh, you see, you need to take the image from here to here using mirrors. Okay. So this is one option. This is actually, if you are if you are, no astronomy, there are some telescopes that operate this option. Some, there are other type of optics. Uh, I, I don't want, I cannot comment exactly which is the best option. Uh, to increase the numerical aperture. If you use more, because the numerical aperture is the ratio between the focal length and the diameter. Of, uh, uh, you have a le uh, you have the size of the lens and the focal length. You practically achieve much longer focal length by this way. But again, uh, this is not a class in optics. I stop here. I, if you want to read more about reflective, opt refract reflective optics and how to calculate resolution, there I will be glad to give you a textbook. Just one question yes. Before. But it's a nice machine, right? Okay, there are two ways, but typically they are moving, you don't move the illuminator because it's too complicated, so you move the mask and you move the wafer simultaneously. And the illumination is constantly on? Yes. Questions? There are three advantages here. One is uh, the optical system, you need to be perfect only in small areas. I didn't mention it, but if you, one way to increase resolution, I told you to, like, to take larger and larger lens. But I cheated a little bit, because if you take larger and larger lens, you start to have aberrations. Part of the lens, are, the lens you start to have problems. So one way is to use not the whole lens, only a set, a, you take the lens, pick up the best part of the lens with the best performance and use it. So this is one advantage. Second advantage is high throughput. If you use a strong lamp, you, run, you can run very quickly. 
So for many applications, let's say you want to print like half micron lithography, one micron lithography, no need to go to slow tools. You can use this tool. Uh, alignment is a problem. So you, people use what's called global alignment. And he, I want to give you this two, I, I should mention that there are two types of alignment. One we call global alignment, mean mask to wafer. Second one is local alignment, is mask to chip, mask to chip, mask to chip. So we, we can do the alignment globally to the whole wafer or every chip separately. It takes more time, but it's more accurate. Um, Optical lithography, this is another tool, uh, which is all, also, also using uh, reflective optics, is a, a tool that you use, this is the lamp, and this is the illuminator. And I want to dedicate a few words about lamps. I, I, I'm sure that each of you which is using a lamp never thought if the light is coherent or non-coherent. You're using a lamp, you illuminate. However, since we are working with a system at the limits of diffraction, we need to decide, is it coherent or not coherent, because the treatment, the analysis is different. Unfortunately, the system here is not coherent and not incoherent. It's partially coherent. If you take a part of the lens, a part of the, 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 the let's say this is a lamp, this is a lamp, this is the illuminating part, light is coming in all directions, so the light from this direction can go here, go through the flat mirror here, reflected and be projected. And I can, I can put the mask somewhere in between. So I can use this illumination, the, sorry, this is the illuminator. I want to generate a beam of light which hits the mask. So this is just the illuminator part. If you take, I, if, as you can see, systems become more and more complicated. Initial system, I showed you just one big lens and one big illuminator. This is, I took this from one of the companies, and this is a typical, this is just to generate a beam of light. However, if the light coming from this point, it can go in this way, but it can also go this way. So from a single point here, light can, the same source can illuminate few parts of the mask. If you take a different point on the illuminator, it will also be spread over the mask. So if you look at the single point, at one point here on the mask, the light can, on this point can come from few places from the lens, from the, from the, from, uh, from the lamp. So if I'm if, if I will have a, a wide source, then the light will be completely incoherent. However, we never have, a, the source that we have is not infinitely small and not infinitely big. It's kind of in the medium, intermediate. So what happens, the light here and the light here can come from the same source. So there's some coherency. Some co the, the light here and the light here can be partially coherent because part of the light here and part of the light here can come from the same spot, but part of the light is coming from different spot. If the light here and here come from the same spot, there is, co there is some level of coherence. If it's not, there is not coherence. So the actual in every spot here, the light is partially coherent. Yes. Okay, this is a topic uh, taking for, I have some slides showing it, um, but I will, I, I s assume that you all are familiar with what is coherent light or not, but coherent light is basically, if I take the light is propagating, and I look at the light here and the light here. If the light here and the light here are all in the same phase, or the phase difference is constant, I assume the light is coherent. There is some coherency between the various regions of the light. If I know the phase here, but the phase here is, I don't know it, it means the light is incoherent. What I'm saying is that if you look at the actual illuminators or actual system, which is, this is, now I, I, it's a really complicated and I, you don't have to remember it by heart, I just want to impress you a little bit. This is a very complicated tool. But if you take, 
the system, this is the lamp, it's a mercury lamp, you generate the light here. The light is going in this system, is going up through a filter. And there's a condenser lens here, taking the light, illuminating the reticle. A reticle is another name for the mask. And here is the complete lens generating here the image. So this is actually it looks in real life, not just by the model. So if I look at the light here, or the light of the lens, every point of the, of the when I illuminate the mask, the light is actually coming from a single source, which is the lamp, but the uh, optical system spread the light in various places. So the light in point here and here and here, they are coming from the same source. So there is some coherence between them. However, part of the light is coming from different parts of the lamp. So there is also some level of incoherency. So we say that this light that we illuminate is partially coherent, which means part of it is coherent, part of it is incoherent. This is what we call partial coherence. It's a very difficult term to understand because you can say, okay, if it's in phase, it's in phase. If it's not in phase, it's not in phase. What I try to explain to you that part of the light is in phase and part of the light is not in phase. This is what I mean. It's assumed that it's like a, a lot of sinuses, a sin, a, a period, a, a waves are propagating. Part of the waves are coherent. Part of it is incoherent. Yes. We can use ultraviolet lasers, and then I will have a fully coherent light. It's possible. Uh, and we used it 20 years ago. There was a lot of tools experimenting with all sorts of lasers. And what was found is the following. First, using coherent light can give you very nice images. However, you have the problem of speckles. And, uh, this is not class for optics, but speckles, it means you look at the image and you see like spots, and spots are coming and disappearing. There's some temporal fluctuations of the light. It's called speckles. Second, people found out that if you use partially coherent light, you get better resolution. So why not using partially coherent light? And I think in the last... And most of the tools people use now, people use lasers, excimer lasers, which I'm going to show you. But these lasers are not single mode and they are not very good, they are not a good coherent source. And sometimes people want even to destroy a little bit the, the coherence, so they introduce a component which is called a diffuser to reduce the coherence of the light. This is the Meyer projection system which I showed you. The Meyer projection system, uh, answering your questions, uh, it's an optical system, it's a high throughput, only alignment through the wafer. You need a global alignment, but not for high resolution. Now, this, this was about the system. Let's go in one step backwards, and let me give you more details about the system. So now, what I did so far, I gave you a general overview of the system. What does it mean to do lithography? I'm now going to review it again, but now in more details, and to break into components. So the first component is the light source. Answering your questions, and this is will answering some of your questions. Why don't we use lasers, and why do we use mercury arc lamps? What we found out in the last... Uh, Microelectronics started in the 50s, so I say in the last 50 years. That the best light source is UV, because we want good, good, good resolution. And if you take a mercury lamp, mercury lamp has a lot of lines, but the most useful ones are the G line, H line, and the I line. So you can find today very good light sources, which are G, H, and I. If you go to our lamp, uh, the system we use in our clean rooms, we can use the I line, we can use the H line, and there's another line, by the way, uh, at about 250 that we can also use, but it's not very common in the industry, more common in research, because the line of mercury lamp in 250 is too weak. Alternatively, you want to use UV lasers. Now, there are f I would say, I would classify two families of UV lasers. One laser is called excimer laser. 
excimer lasers are lasers which are based on the, uh, on the, spon uh, on the uh, excitation or the lasing effect in gases which contain fluorine, krypton fluoride, uh, argon fluoride, fluoride itself. If you take fluorides, it's a gas, they can create some uh, uh, argon, argon is a noble gas, fluoride is very active gas, but in other certain conditions argon and fluoride can generate some mo molecule which is not so stable, but it's a molecule that exists for a short time, and this molecule, if you excite it, you can create a emission at a very short wavelength. So you can generate lights at 248, 193, 157, 196. This I will give you the details. And recently, 13, which is a different source, not eczema laser, and I'm going to discuss, this is called deep UV, this regime, VUV, and EUV or extreme UV, which is another name actually for soft X-ray, because this wavelength of 30 nanometer is almost touching X-ray. So if you look at mercury arc lamp, G line, H line, and I line, if you look at the mercury arc lamp, this is what you get. If you, uh, by the way, uh, we have here in this room fluorescent light, and this fluorescent light they use mercury to excite the fluorescence. We don't see the mercury light because it's ultraviolet, but the, ultra, but the ultraviolet, if you look at the, at the fluorescent light, the fluorescent light is coated with, with fluorescent material. But this lens, the, sorry, these lamps are not so high pressure because they are not so powerful. If you want to get very powerful emission, you increase the pressure of the mercury vapor, and you can get emission, at the, the, the big emission is at 365, 405, and uh, 365. Krypton fluoride emits very beautiful, very beautifully 248. Argon fluoride at 193. These are the strongest sources used today. And laser pulsed plasma emitted very strong emission at 30 nanometer. We call it EUV. Now this is the emission of the mercury lamp, and this is the emission of the. Uh, this is the, the red. The red is the mercury lamp, the blue is a uh, typical emission for an eczema laser. Eczema laser is typically extremely powerful, however, it's not a continuous emission. Eczema laser emits light in very short pulses, every pulse is about 10 to 20 nanoseconds. Which is actually not a bad idea, because you emit one light, you, you emit one pulse, expose your uh, wafer, and then until the next pulse, you can move the substrate. So actually, many systems, you emit one pulse or two pulses and three pulses, and you, move, you can move the substrate between the pulses, so you don't waste time. Uh, krypton fluoride, argon fluoride are the dominant system. Uh, krypton fluoride, the workhorse of the industry, 248, and the argon fluoride, 193. The fluoride laser emits at 157. Uh, the krypton fluoride is extremely powerful. You can, uh, for every pulse, you can get up to one and a half joule for a single pulse. This is a really powerful system. You have to be careful when you deal with such lasers. Uh, the argon fluoride is weaker, and the fluoride, the fluorine, sorry, uh, laser is very short wavelengths, but typically not so powerful, which is a big problem in manufacturing, which it means it's, the higher the power, the faster the machine, because you can run it faster. Uh, Krypton fluoride can emit up to 500 pulses per second, which is very useful, and the pulse length is typically 25 nan nanosecond, and you can get with a better than quarter micron, with uh, argon fluoride better than 0.15, with uh, fluoride better than uh, 0.15. So this is the images I showed you before. Uh, so this is the system that people use today for microlithography. I would like to talk a little bit about uh, what I would call next generation lithography, 
which will be used either for nanolithography or eventually for uh, also for next generation microtechnology which will be in the high resolution regime. So the most promising optical source or photon source is the EUV, enhanced UV at 30 nanometers. Electron mimetography which replace, takes, instead of illuminating with photons, you illuminate with electrons and you can get very high resolution or if you want, uh, you can illuminate with ions. X-ray lithography uh, can be very high resolution but there's a very big problem of making masks and I will talk also a little bit about soft lithography and scanning probe lithography which is very useful for nanotechnology applications. So uh, this is the next generation lithography which actually will be in the next lecture. Um, so this is uh, uh, just, okay. Uh, I'm not so much, for the, see the, one of the, in practical lithography you need, if you have a beam of light or a beam of electrons, you want to navigate it, you want to steer it. I'm not so much familiar with optics for gamma rays. I'm not sure people can use it. It's, I, 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 you have to excuse me, I'm not so familiar with this. With X-ray lithography, people don't use optics. People just use one-to-one, -one, which is why this technology is not applied today in the industry in large scale, because it's very difficult to make nanometer scale mask on a very large area. So X-ray can be very useful for universities for research, but not very useful for mass manufacturing. Gamma rays, I don't know. Ion beam was very promising, but it's a problem. Electron beam lithography is very common, very useful, very good resolution, but very, very slow and expensive. So we use in universities and lab, and we use e-beam lithography to make masks. EUV, enhanced UV with a 30 nanometer wavelength, is considered today the most promising technology for high throughput, but I have to make a comment. It's very possible that somebody will find a solution for the e-beam lithography, running like few beams in parallel, or using some very clever optics or some clever sources to solve this problem. And if I would assume that the, f the winner seems to be the EUV, but electron beam lithography seems also to be very, very uh, probable. Alternatively, I'm going to show you a little bit soft lithography, scanning probe lithography, which can give excellent resolution, but very slowly. And I will have one more question before we go to the break. What are the usage today for 45 and 45 nanometer, people use argon fluoride and F2 and use some special optics which we call uh, use some special optics which I'm going to show you next generation 32 nanometers will use also 193 or 157 with immersion lithography using instead of instead of taking the image in air or in vacuum you illuminate in liquid so the numerical aperture can go very increase significantly and actually and you will have an exercise a class exercise this week and Asia will show you the practical limits including uh, advanced uh, eczema laser lithography. I will dedicate the whole lecture for these light sources, for, this, uh, for those, uh, those technologies, but today I will slow down and go back to the uh, classical lithography because I still there's some parameters that I need to explain to you before we go to next generation lithography and the most important issue is how to estimate the image quality how do we measure uh, in order to know that it's not enough to, 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 to do the lithography we need to characterize it because we need not only to measure the dimension but if we want to do it again next week or to do it again the week after. I want to develop a process that will allow you every week to print the best possible quality. 
So we are going to talk about critical dimension control, which is a little bit uh, not so much optics, but it's a lot of common sense, and we are going to take a break now. Back to modeling. So I showed you the systems, I showed you the illuminators, but let's go back and discuss again the practical concept of resolution. And let's do the following. Let's say we have a mask, and the mask has a line L and a space S. Line L, space S. So when we illuminate the light, illuminate the mask, and take the image, I would like to have a, a region that uh, will have a line on the mask and a space on this region. So. I'm showing you this picture because this is kind of ideal case. However, this ideal case is very common when you do simulation. And I'm showing you this because this is related to your homework. Because when you do homework, when you simulate the structure, you, instead of solving the whole structure, when you, let's say you want to solve this. So what do you do? You are, let me move a little bit backwards, sorry, you take this image and you want to solve the wave equation. So you want to solve the wave equation, you put the boundary conditions and the lens. But instead of solving the complete wave equation over all the mask, you're using the fact that the mask is periodic. So you don't need to solve the whole structure. So what do you do? You solve it only here. And because the solution is periodic, you can take the Fourier series or expand it to the whole space. You don't need to solve over the whole space, you can solve it only in one half of the period. So if you solve it here, you can generate the second half, you, you, know, you know the whole structure, you can generate the next line, etc. So today when we solve the wave equation in order to solve such systems, we solve only for one half of the period. And by the way, these terms, line and space, are very common. And it's not so far away from real life, because in real life, you, in, if you go to integrated circuits, you never see a single line. It's always like 1 bit, 2 bit, so it's 8 lines, 16 lines, 32 lines, 64 lines. You always have structures which are periodic, not infinitely periodic, but you can always have enough lines in parallel. So again, we have the illuminator and the condenser lens. You're generating a parallel beam, illuminating the mask. And then you have an aperture. You generate the image over the mask. So if you look at the light intensity here, look at the mask here, and calculate the light intensity right at the exit of the mask, it will be like this. Black gives you zero. and Transparent give you one. I normalize the, the, the values. So this is black, white, uh, black transparent, black transparent. If you look at the intensity of, on, the, on the wafer, you got the maximum, and I normalize the values, the maximum is less than one, and the minimum is not zero. And the, re the reason is we got some diffraction, so light from here diffract and we got some light in this region because the light from the illuminated part goes through the optical system and part of it reaches this region. So if you look at the light here, you see that this is actually this actually is not such a bad image. And what I'm showing here, this is a, this graph is the intensity of the light of the wafer on the wafer as a function of distance. Now if we use a reduction of four to one for example, so every four microns on the mask is one micron on the wafer. If it's a one-to-one, -one, then it's every micron here is a micron here. So this is the light intensity on the wafer, this is the light intensity on the mask, and this is the effect of the optics, effect of the diffraction of the optics. So the first parameter that if you deal with optics you define is, we call it contrast. Contrast is defined as I max minus I min divided by I max plus I min. Or the difference between 
the peak and the valley to the sum of the peak and the valley. And this is a very valuable figure of merit because when it's zero, it means we have no contrast at all. However, when it's maximum, maximum is when I max equal one and I zero equal, I minimum equal zero. So when it's maximum, the contrast is equal to one. So this value gets number between zero to one. Zero is terrible, one is ideal. And I max plus I min is one. Uh, if we have complete symmetry in the system, and we assume so. But you can think of some pathological cases, like off-axis illumination. And it's not necessarily, it's close to one. It's, if everything is ideal, it should be equal to one. True. This is very useful value. However, I have to warn you. Don't over-exaggerate because of its importance. It's important, but not the most important. Today, you can get very good lithography even when the contrast is not so good. Because if I put here the threshold of the system, if I will use a photoresist, I will use, this is the illumination. I'm using this light to illuminate a photosensitive material. This photosensitive material is defined as the following. If there is light, the photosensitive material responds. If there is no light, there is no response. I can design the photosensitive material, for example, that this will be the threshold. Above it, I will have a chemical reaction, a photochemical reaction. Below it, I will, do, I will not have photochemical reaction. If I can design such an ideal material, I'm going to show you later that it's very difficult to have such a material, but ideally I can do it, I, I, can, do, I can define it, and normal photoresists are actually very non-linear. Normal photoresists today, normal light sensitive materials today are very, very non-linear. And people are trying to make them more and more non-linear, because the non-linearity the, the non is good. Because if I put here the threshold, Above it, I will have light. It means I will have response of the polymer. Below it, it's dark. No response of the polymer. So if this will be the threshold, I will have here a well-defined line in the photoresist. Even though the light intensity function is not so much good quality. So using a very nonlinear light sensitive polymer, I can compensate for the degradation of the quality of the image. This is one parameter. Practically, people find that photosensitive materials are not so sensitive to the value of the minimum. If you are below the threshold, you are below the threshold. So if the I minimum can vary a little bit, it's not a big, it's, it's a problem, but not a big problem. It's more sensitive to the maximum, and it's even much more sensitive, people found out, not to the maximum or the minimum, or the maximum or the minimum, but the slope of the curve here. It's an experimental result that the resolution or the critical dimension is a strong function of the slope here in a special scale, in a logarithmic scale, and I'm going to show you. It's a it's very interesting uh, uh, observation, which we can give it some proof, uh, analytical proof. Uh, it's not so simple to give it analytical proof. We can simulate it and prove it, and this will be one of your homeworks, to show what is the best parameter. But let me give you a little bit explanation why the slope here is important. Because if we define a threshold of the photoresist, the steeper the slope, the more the error of the threshold is a function. Because if, if let's say this will have a minimum and maximum, but the slope here will be very steep, somehow. Then even if the threshold is not well defined, I still get very good resolution. Because it doesn't matter if I'm here and here. But if the slope here is very weak, 
if the slope is very shallow, not very, not very steep, then every deviation of the quality of the photoresist, every, any deviation of this threshold will change the dimension of the line. So I will be, I, uh, that's a parameter that people learn to leave that it's not so much, the resolution is very important, but it's very important also to every day to print with the same resolution. So it's not only the resolution. So th this is the image contrast. It's important. And I'm going to discuss it in further details later. And I'm going to discuss it. I'm going to explain to you the effect of the, sl of the slope here. Now, we define an MTF, modulation transfer function. And the modulation transfer function is basically if we plot the image contrast as a function of the periodicity of the structure. And we define the periodicity as one over the we can we define as one over the feature size. I can plot the contrast versus feature size, but it's much more common not to plot it this way but to plot contrast versus one over the feature size or how many lines we have per centimeter. If we have feature size, which is a, uh, a, a, the line is one micron, space is one micron, so line and space is two microns. How many lines per centimeter we have? If have the pitch is two microns, 500. If, I, if the pitch is one micron, it's 1,000 microns per centimeter. If the pitch is 10 microns, it's 100. So this value is actually, if some of you study optics, or it's a special frequency. It's the how many lines we have per centimeter. The larger the value, the smaller the feature. And it's very useful because we deal typically with small features. So this is a, a kind of an interesting presentation that we expand the region of the, that we are interested in. Because we are interested, we want to understand, we want to look at the behavior at the smaller feature. I don't care much about large images. I care much about smaller images. What happens is that the smaller the image, if, if an image becomes smaller and smaller, the contrast becomes worse, bec the, 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 according to the previous picture, if I will shrink, if I reduce the periodicity, I will get smaller intensity because I will give, I, there is more diffraction. So this is called modulation transfer function and it depends on the feature size. For every optical system you can measure the modulation transfer function. It's a characteristic parameter of the system and it can tell you the contrast for every given frequency, and you can learn a lot about it. It will t tell you a lot about the system. Now let's go back to the spatial coherence. I'm going to discuss it a few times because it's a very important parameters, and I'm not going to give you uh, in... Uh, let's assume that you have a lens, and the lens is illuminating a mask when you have two slits. This is a very special mask, only two slits. So, uh, I apologize for the quality, maybe I should change it to dark light, but this is an illuminator. We have a lamp, and the lamp is illuminating the two slits. If the slits are narrow, what happens, the light here and the light here, they are coming from the same lamp, and I, I define here another slit. So this is the mask, and this is the illuminator, which I define in other slit. What I will get here, I will get your interference. You all know the famous uh, experiments sometimes we do in high school. We illuminate two slits, we got your interference. But if we look uh, in this structure, if we have a very small slit, we are generating coherent light, and the coherent light will propagate and illuminate this region. This is what I call special coherence. Special coherence can be if we illuminate from a single source. Do you see it over there? 
a little bit quality. I, I should instead of putting in light blue, I should have put it in darker characters. But if I generate any, if the light is coming here, the wave here and the wave here are in phase, which means the light is coherent. And then I have this beautiful interference at the bottom. So again, if I define a coherence. If I have a very small source, very point source, I will, I will get that all the waves here are in the same phase. Because they're all coming from the same point source, all are in phase. And if I, will ha if I have a coherent source, this is the mask, this is the, uh, this is the mask, and all the light here, the light all over the mass, the light is fully coherent because the light here, 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 and here are all coming from the same source. However, typical lamps are not infinitely small. Typical lamps has, they have some volume. They're not so big, by the way, but they're not so small. So if you look at the light coming from here, from this point, the light coming from here propagates here and here also to here. The lights from this point propagates here and to here. So if I, if I look at this point here, for example, the, this point collects light from here and from here. These points also collect light from here and here. So part of the light here and part of the light here are coming from the same point. So they are coherent. But part of it is not. It's not coherent. To make things more complicated, Typically, we don't have just a lamp. Usually, we have on the back side another illuminator, a reflector on the back side, which also contributes to the coherency. So, we defined a level of coherency, S. S is defined as numerical aperture of the condenser divided by the numerical aperture of the objective. I have to go back and remind you what is a numerical aperture? And this was a long time ago, last week. We define numerical aperture in optical system. This is the illuminator. We have a lens. This is the lamp. And we have the ratio between the, the, the radius of the lens divided by the distance, which is about the focal length of the lens. The distance between the, the radius and the focal length of this lens we call it numerical aperture. And this is numerical aperture of the condenser, of the illuminator. This is numerical aperture of the, of the objective of, of this lens. By the way, we, you, can, you should have asked me, why do I need a pupil? A pupil, it's a kind of a hole. If you see here, this is the lens. And typically, we put a pupil. We limit this alpha, which is actually not a good idea, you can think, because limiting the alpha means small Na. Small Na means bad resolution. Why should I do it? Why should I limit the size? Because usually the quality of the lens on the periphery is not so good, and we have a lot of aberrations. Every lens has a kind of a region which is good quality, so we, you, we, have, we need to use a pupil to limit the size. So this is... Sorry? It's also ch the pupil changes the depth of the focus, and you know it from camera. By the way, it's also changed the depth of focus. You all know, if you have a camera, at least old cameras, when we can change it by hand, that if you want to have a, a very large depth of focus, you need a small pupil. Small pupil, which means very high numerical aperture. Uh, sorry, very small numerical aperture, sorry. NA is very small. If NA is very small, DOF is 1 over NA square, is very large. So the depth of focus is very large. The, and, but you, you pay in resolution. So if you take very, very large depth of focus in imaging, some of your family will not be out to focus, which sometimes can be a good idea, but it's not such a good quality image. So this is the difference between, uh, not the difference, this is uh, the same facts that we use here for lithography are good for, uh, good for uh, uh, 
actual uh, photography. And this is why if you want a professional camera, by the way, you have very big lens. The bigger the lens, you can have the good resolution and the good depth of focus. You have to pay for this. It costs money. But let's go back to our lecture. This is the depth of focus. is 1 over numerical aperture square. If you want to take a very large depth of focus, key, uh, reduce the numerical aperture. Put a pupil. Okay, so we are back into our lecture. This is a special coherence. Now, because we have the numerical aperture of this condenser, of the illuminator, a numerical aperture of the lens, uh, the smaller the source, the higher the coherence. The bigger the source, the lower the coherence. So we define S. S is a number which is related to the coherency. There are, some, there, are many there, there are many definitions for coherence. One of the definitions is a value called S. And if S is equal to 0, it's totally coherent. Because S equals 0 means numerical aperture of the condenser is 0, which means that the source is an infinitely small. When we increase the source, increase the source, numerical aperture of the source increases, then S increases. If we reduce this lens, redu uh, reduce the objective lens, we reduce the numerical, numerical aperture here, and then S is increasing also. Uh, so S, we call S, uh, S is a number that we many times use in imaging. S gives you a kind of a number which is related to how much you are coherent. Now zero is absolutely coherent, and infinity is completely non-coherent. What is important is that experimentally it is shown that the resolution of the system depends on this value of s. And the, optic, the optic, optimal number, and it was found by a lot of papers and modeling, is in the range of about 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.6. 0.9, but this regime. If you go much below 0.5 or much above 1, then you, the resolution becomes less. So as S of 0 0.5, 0 0.6 is typical design trade-off for many systems. And what you see, if you look at the modulation transfer function, a function that I showed you before, as a function of the frequency or 1 over the feature size. So this is S. As you increase S, this is S equals 0. Fully coherent light. Fully coherent light, you get the excellent image here, but it drops very quickly. Now you kill the coherence. You reduce the coherence. How do you do it? Use a bigger lens at the condenser. Maybe put some illuminator on the back side. If you do this, you, the resolution at these uh, very big lines, very wide lines, is worth. But here, see what happens. You get better resolution for small lines, which is interesting, because this is what we are interested. So the interesting part, by increasing S, you actually improve the resolution here. Uh, but if you increase too much, you start. You, you don't have resolution here, which is a problem. So typical value that people believe which is useful is 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. And this is why in real life, in real system, we don't use fully coherent light. It's not a paradox, it's a fact of life that if you want to print very narrow lines, incoherent light will give you better resolution. If you want to print wide lines, coherent light is better. But we don't want to print big lines. We want to print small lines. Yes? And the point in the middle is dependent on the frequency of the light. The whole picture here, which I plotted, is normalized and without... Uh, if I <coughs> okay, let's play, let's do some uh, experiment. 
Let's say I reduce the wavelengths. This is an image for one wavelength. Now I take a shorter wavelength. What will happen to the curve? What, it will shift to which direction? To here. If I use shorter wavelength, the whole curve will shift to this direction. Okay? If I will increase the numerical aperture, it also will shift in this direction. So we can play with this curve. We can get better resolution by improving the wavelengths, by, inc by shorter wavelengths, by reducing numerical aperture. We pay by making worse depth of focus, but we can get better resolution. However, you have to remember that there are some other variables that I forgot to mention. For example, another variable is the light intensity. I can increase depth of focus by taking a short, a smaller and smaller lens, but then the amount of light will be less, which means longer exposure. It takes more time, costs more money. So I am playing here with only two variables, which is resolution and depth of focus. But you have to remember that in real life, there are other variables, which is cost, which is how much time you do the exposure. And how much time you do the exposure is important, because in real systems, there are some mechanical vibrations. And they have certain frequency. Every room, even this room, you have a, a mechanical vibration. So we have to pay a lot of money to put all the optical systems on very, very stable stands. But even very stable systems have some vibration frequency. So if the whole system moves in one second, and your exposure time is, nine, is, is 10 nanoseconds, you don't care. But if, 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 but if the exposure takes 10 seconds, then you have a problem. So this is the MTF. And uh, what I, again, uh, it's the same. I talked about optical contrast, but optical contrast and MTF are practically, it's for, it's the same. But I have to be very careful if I, because, uh, what I just said is not exactly accurate because we defined uh, the contrast for the for coherent light uh, or the MTF. We define it by the intensity. So if you work with the coherent light, sometimes you can have some other definitions. But I, I try to keep this lecture to a certain level. So excuse me if I'm a little bit inaccurate. If if I'm not using the, the, the exact term, but the exact, but the important is that if I have two slits on the mask and the amplitude coming out on the wafer is like these two peaks and I define the threshold, the red line is the threshold, if the two slits, if the two spaces, if the two lines are separated, it's very easy to separate between this peak and this peak. But if this is the two lines and the two in, the, the, this intensity of this light, intensity of the light coming from here, this is the sum of the two intensities, I will not see here. This, the, if the threshold here is below this red line, or at this red line, I will, not see the separ I will not separate between them. So again, I define the modulation transfer function as I max minus I min divided by I max plus I min. And a MTF depends on both exposure system and the mask. Now, what are the limits? We like this definition of image contrast or MTF because it's a very simple definition, easy to understand. But practically, there are some limits. <laughs> this definition is only good for periodic structures. It's actually not so bad, but in, in, in some cases, I really need to calculate the resolution limits for holes, for dots, and for circles. It's not applicable for isolated features and large features. It's also very sensitive to I mean. The calculation of the MTF is I max minus I mean divided by I max plus I mean. But in practice, in real life, we find that the resolution that we actually measure in ex real experiment, it's not so sensitive to I mean. So we need to do some corrections and the medium correlation to the actual lithography quality. 
In some cases you can have bad MTF and good lithography. In some cases you can have good MTF and bad lithography if you don't choose the right photoresist or you don't understand the photoresist. So the next part of the equation is the photoresist and we need to understand it. But before that, people looked for a better metric, a better measure if the quality of the image is bad or good. So if we look at a single line, let's say this is a single line, this is the image of a single line. And this is going very close to zero, this is actually not so bad image. And this is the image of a single line. By the way, uh, if you're very careful, you can see here a single line, the Fourier transform of a single line is a sink. So actually you get some light leaks to other places. So you define, you find the slope of this line. And it can be shown that for normal optics, coherent light, the slope is equal to 2.5 lambda times numerical aperture. The slope is also related to the resolution. So if I measure the slope of the image, I can get a number which is also proportional to the resolution using the similar equation. So if you can measure the slope, it's actually a good metric to the resolution because the, the resolution and the slope are related. But you can say, okay, but the MTF is also related. But experimental results show that if you measure the MTF and you measure the slope and then compare it to the actual resolution, in real life, this slope gives you better estimate about the quality of the results. So in many cases, people use the slope here. And by the way, this is real simulation. This is K1.6 feature. And this is a, but I didn't put the wavelength, so you have to excuse me. Uh, and I will relate this later. Remember that we can, rem we can calculate the image, we can solve the wave equation, we can calculate the contrast, and we can calculate the slope. Next step is to do the lithography. What I'm telling you is that the lithography, a good estimate to the lithography will be the slope and the second best is the contrast. Why life is so complicated? Why we are, why I'm going around in circle instead of just giving you the final result? Because in actual lithography it's more complicated. It's not just a, fl a flat surface and an image. In real life you're making devices. You're making nanostructures, you can make transistors, you can make MEM structures. And these structures have some shape. For example, this is a typical structure of silicon wafer before we make transistors. Typical structure before we make transistors. We have substrate, which is silicon. STI is shallow trench isolation. This is the modern technique to isolate between transistors. I showed you at the beginning of this lecture the old way where we have a very thick field oxide, but it was not planar. Today, people produce very planar structure. And on this, uh, on, on this material, you put some photoresist. And let's say that you want to illuminate the photoresist. So you put the mask and you illuminate it. And I, I did not plot all the optical system and everything. I just, let's say this region, there's no light. This region, there is light. And now I coat the substrate with a light-sensitive light polymer. And the light goes inside and hit this structure. But light can hit, for example, if I have a little bump here, light can come here and illumine and be reflected to the sides. Also light can hit the bottom and go up and we can get interference inside the photoresist. How do we take this into consideration? Because until now I just calculated the image 
without assuming that anything coming back from the substrate. I just assume all the light coming hit the substrate and disappear. But in real life, light is, can hit the substrate and go back and interfere with itself. So we have to take this into consideration. So we have interference problems from the substrate, from the films on the substrate. Interference can be from the light sensitive material. But let's say under the light sensitive material there's another film. In this case, for example, it's polysilicon. Let's say there is, let's say there is polysilicon here. The polysilicon itself can reflect some of the light, but also some of the light can... It's, uh, polysilicon reflects most of the light, but it's very, if it's very, very thin, some of the light can be absorbed in the material. So the thin film can reflect the light, we can cause interference. Thin film can absorb some of the light. And because we have these bumps, we can get scattering. So this region, we can get light scattered into this region. So the, we can get a diffraction. And the previous lecture and this lecture, I mostly talked about diffraction. But we can also have scattering. And the res result is that this region which is supposed to be unexposed, got some light. So if we talk about real life lithography, we have to take into consideration the mask, the wavelengths, numerical aperture, the optical system, but also the substrate. So this, is, this was kind of disclaimer, why life is more complicated. We can have other problems. We can have, for example, photoresist, and we have a single line. For some reason, can be a metal line, can be gate of the device. So if we illuminate this structure, light is coming, and we can get interference inside the photoresist. We can get interference, but what happens is that if the photoresist itself is uneven, the interference here can be different than the interference here. Lights coming in, reflected. It can be reflected from the bottom, from the top back, and reflected, and we can get a standing wave inside this structure. The standing wave depends on the thickness of the film. If the film is a certain thickness, we can get the, all the light is coming here is not, is not reflected. If the thickness is approximately equal to one quarter lambda, then nothing will come out, which means all, everything is absorbed. But if the thickness can be different, then we can get a lot of reflection. Now look at this region here. Here, this surface is perpendicular to the light. Here, the light hits this area with an angle, and look here how thick is the photoresist. From, look from here to here. So if we get some non-flat surfaces, the Effective thickness of the photoresist is huge. So we, it's possible that we get much less exposure in this region. So we can expose the resist here, but do not expose it here, which means we'll have problems later. So what do we do? We increase the light intensity. So we got a lot of light here. But it's a problem. Maybe we give too much light here. Then we have other problems. And last but not least important issue, let's assume that this substrate is a metal. It's not, photo, it's not silicon, it's metal. Light is coming here, penetrating the photoresist is, and reflected. What is the light intensity in the photoresist right next to the metal? Do you remember from the basic law of physics? What is, the, what is the electric field right next to metal? Zero. Which means right next to the metal, the effective intensity of light is very close to zero. Which means, if you put, if you put photosensitive material over metal, and you illuminate it next to the metal, very little, the actual intensity of light is very low. And the reason is, you illuminate, and the reflection, the phase is exactly 180 degrees opposite. 
So the two, the incoming beam and the outcoming beam, they cancel each other. So effectively you get here zero light. Which means this area sees a lot of light. And you can increase the light. The area next to the metal sees very little light. Which can cause later very big problems during lithography. And we have to take special measures when we do lithography over metals. So we, we have more reflection, we have more standing wave. We can even have regions inside the photoresist with zero intensity. So one part is exposed, one part is not exposed. The standing wave is a big issue. Reflection is a big issue. Light can go here, reflect it, go in this direction, can be also a big problem. So the standing wave cause non-uniform exposure along the thickness of the photoresist. So this is, and this is how it looks in real life. This is an image of a photoresist. And if you look at the size of the photoresist, you can see this is photoresist and this is space. This is a photoresist and this is space. The black is the space. And uh, this is a special technique, by the way, uh, this structure was uh, infinitely large, but they cut this system. There are special techniques using focused ion beam method. You take a beam of ions and you cut it the same way as you cut butter with a knife. And this machine is called focused ion beam cutter. It cuts the substrate. You can get a very nice image of the cross section of the line and how they look. But if you look very careful, you can see here some periodic structure, which is the reflection of the standing wave. Also, at the bottom, you see the line is wider than at the top, which means here we got less light than at the top. And you can see that the actual total image here is two dimension because this is a two-dimensional structure. And if it was a whole, we have actually to solve the wave equation in three dimensions if you really want to get idea of what's going on inside. And by the way, this is a very aggressive lithography. It's not so bad, actually. And we define another parameter we call aspect ratio, which is uh, the ratio between the height and the width of the trench. And the as I, I didn't calculate, but here the aspect ratio is about 3 to 4, which is not so bad. We also identify another parameter we call the slope of the sidewalls. Now, we want the sidewalls to be 90 degrees. It's considered the best. But we can live with other angles as long as we get good results. So, by the way, if you, this is, you can see here on the side, it's a thicker line. It's a very interesting features, but I will skip this one. So how to solve this problem of reflection from the backside? The most common way to solve it is to put on the backside of the film a very thin layer which absorbs the light. We call it anti-reflective coating. A, a very common layer is using a material called titanium nitride. Titanium nitride that people use a lot in a, a aluminum metallization or other applications, it has the property it absorbs UV very strongly. Or if you, you can buy some polymers or some materials which actually absorbs very strong the light. So this anti-reflective coating or arc is a very common solution. It's very useful. <coughs> it can improve the resolution significantly, especially in very complex structure. So in many cases, you have a single line of a very large area, then you don't really care about this. But if you are designing complex structures, and in the industry it's very common because integrated circuits are very complicated. But even here I saw some of the students designing some devices which are very complicated. You may need some methods to improve the resolution, and this is one of them. So the best is to put a backside anti-reflective anti coating, and the common name in the industry is bark or bottom anti-reflective coating. And if you have this bottom anti-reflective coating, you reduce 
the effect of the standing wave and also prevents scattering, which is also important. So this is very common in high resolution lithography today. So you can either have bark which absorbs the light or a, a layer which changes the phase of the light to prevent the interference. So you can have phase shift cancellation of light, you can have uh, the bottom light, but the bottom line you put a bark uh, like tit titanium nitride, which uh, if you, the light is coming here, uh, you got cancellation of the standing waves and reduces the amount of the interference inside the line. So this is the backside reflecting. So these are the common method of arc, of bark. And the next step is how to improve resolution by even farther. Yeah, Ken, yes. Uh, once you put the titanium nitrate, does it bother the connection between layers? Uh, next step is the lithography. And the next step is to etch it. Where you, uh, because the titanium nitrate typically sits in something else which you need to etch later. Of course, yeah. if you keep it everywhere, it will short everything. So one way to improve resolution, and this is not, uh, let's say, this is in labs, this is in research, it's in experiment, you can find today some commercial tools, but it, this is not in mass production. This is, uh, I would say, the next generation lithography. This is what we expect to find in the next few years. Instead of, this is the lens, this is the substrate, this is the wafer, you put a, a very thin layer of photoresist on top, this is the light sensitive polymer, and this is the lens. What you can think is put here some liquid with a refractive index higher than one. So if the refractive index is higher than one, the numerical aperture increases because the numerical aperture is n times sinus alpha, n times the numerical aperture without air, then the refractive, x, a, a refractive, a refractive index equal to one. If you put water, for example, do you remember the refractive index of water? 1.33. Then you can improve the numerical aperture by 33%, improve the resolution by 33%. But the calculation is a little bit more complicated because I put a liquid on one side of the lens, not on the two sides of the lens. The common is to put the liquid only in one side of the lens. The other side of the lens is still open to air. So the calculation is a little bit more complicated. And for example, I took it from a paper from Berlin from 2006. What it's actually doing, you can think about it, this is the, this is the uh, lens, and the lens is, if you can think of the lens, the lens is taking the beam coming from the top system and converge it to points on the photoresist. If you put here water, what you're actually doing, you can move it a little farther because in water, uh, if you, the, the, the refractive index of lens is in the range of 1.5. Air is 1, so you get here strong uh, change in the angle. If you put here water, you get here weaker change in the angle, so you can put the lens a little farther away. So you got effectively higher numerical aperture and you got better resolution. Now typical, for example, a refractive index of quartz at this wavelength of very deep UV, it's about 1.56. Refractive index of water in deep UV is actually 1.46. Refractive index of water in normal light is 1.33, but in UV, in ultraviolet is much higher, and refractive index of photoresist is 1.75. It's, it's a typical number to most polymers that people use in lithography. And if you look at the numbers, if you take a numerical aperture of 0.9, then sinus theta is 0.58, but if you take the water, 
then you got, uh, uh, sorry, uh, here it's point 8, this is the angle, if you take a, fo if you take the, if you put water, you can actually co either collect light from a larger angle, or actually get the image in, in this way. Um, it's a little bit more complicated as usual, because if you use water, and the light is coming here, it's, we all know that uh, refraction depends on the mode of the light. If you have TM, or transverse magnetic, or TE light, you will get different path. But again, too much optics. But actually, if you use uh, TM or TE modes, you will get different resolutions. So one way to control resolution, and this is for if people here are taking classes on optics is not only to choose the wavelengths but also choose the polarization of the light. Polarization of the light also affects resolution. Um, this is, by the way, just to, if, if you forgot, T, this is the TM light, the transverse magnetic, the electric field is in this direction to the propagation of the light. And this is the TE light, T light, the propagation, the E is parallel to the direction of the substrate. This is the definition of TM and T light. And this is how uh, it actually looks in real life. And this is the biggest problem of immersion lithography. We got beautiful resolution, but since we have water, we can have bubbles. And this is a printed bubble. I took this image from uh, if you look to the website of Sematech, uh, they have beautiful pictures from research on uh, it's www.sematech.org, -E and they have wonderful images, wonderful presentations for lithography. And you can also have water stain. After you take out the wafer, if the water, if you have some water, it dries and you get water stain. So this is the biggest problem of immersion lithography. And this is kind of a very stupid problem, but it's a problem. And until we manage to solve it, it's uh, one way is, is to replace the water with other liquids. Questions? Yes, the water absorbs some of the light, and when they absorb some of the light, they actually generate bubbles. Um, okay, yes. So one way to solve it is to, instead of standing water, you flow the water very rapidly. You can have, uh, you can print particles, you can, all, all sorts of problems, because you have liquids, the liquids can have particles, it's not vacuum. And this is, actually, this is actually how it looks in real life. In real life, you take the lens assembly and you flow the liquid around the structure and here you see these beautiful bubbles inside the water but if you flow them you kind of flow them away from the point that you take the image so this is called the immersion fluid and uh, this is a vacuum that actually holds the wafer and this is the whole system of the lens apparatus and if I will go and this is a very complicated <coughs> Uh, picture, so I think we'll go to 10 minutes break and then we'll go to this picture. Actual results from existing systems for the best resolution that people can get today. So the Mercury G line, which is the old system uh, with numerical aperture of 0.45. Uh, it's about the best you can get is this is two, three, four, it's about 500 nanometers or half a micron, which is not so bad. 365 nanometer, the eye line with a 0.65 numerical aperture, you can be in the range of 0.4, and if you go to systems of krypton fluoride with a numerical aperture of 1.82, you will be in the range of below 0.2 micron. 
the big throughput, the, the big trust, the big, uh, 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 I would say, the, the, the advanced system today is the argon fluoride. We can actually print, this is about 0.4 or 40 nanometers. This is what we believe, not, not, sorry, not what we believe, this is what we know that exists and available. If we do immersion lithography, we may go slightly better. 0.35 numerical aperture can give you 0.4 and below. The, flu the fluorine system is here, it's actually worse, but if we can get the, uh, the good immersion, maybe we can get good results. The EUV, which is 13 nanometer, can give us, this is what we can get today, but the EUV, the 30 nanometer, uh, the numerical aperture is not so uh, not so good, but the resolution we can get is uh, in this regime, which is about less than 20 nanometers. Uh, so EUV is the most promising system today. So I'm. I'm uh, I'm going to show you later some more system, but I need to, if I want to complete the story, so far we talked about the image, I gave you some advanced information about images, but I need to, now I need to, take, to look at the other half of the equation, I need to look at the photoresist questions. Immersion, yes. No, can be other liquids. There are some other potential liquids. Water is very advantageous because you can get a very clean and good quality, but uh, it's possible that people will use other liquids. Okay, so now we need to talk about the other side of the equation, about photosensitive polymers. So I will talk about photoresists, their modeling, and once we know the photoresist, I'm going to talk about focus exposure matrix. How do we calibrate lithography? So if we look at the system, why do, what is the lithography that we actually do? First we take the substrate, we coat it with the photoresist. Typically after we coat the photoresist, after we coat the photoresist, after we coat the surface with photoresist, the photoresist is a polymer. The polymer can be a little bit unstable because there might be some solvent, some, something that should come out. So it's very common that after spinning of the photoresist, we bake it. We heat it up to 80, 90 degrees just to dry it a little bit. We don't want too much because we don't want to change its chemical properties. Next, we expose the photoresist. So here we have light, no light, light, no light. So this region, this area, w is affected by light. If it's a positive photoresist, later we remove this region. How we remove it? We take the substrate, we take the structure and immerse it. We put it, we dip it, we insert it into liquid, special liquid, which is called developer. And this developer has very unique properties. It removes only photoresist which was affected by light. Because the light hits the photoresist and changes the properties of the photoresist. And only where we have light, the photoresist is soluble. It dissolved, it dissolved inside in the developer. So here it was light and we removed the photoresist, light we removed the photoresist. So the next step is the, the gray is the photoresist, the black here is something that I want to remove. So the next step is I'm using the photoresist to protect the structure and I etch this black whatever it is. I can etch metal, I can etch silicon, I can etch other components. I can etch insulators, oxide. So this is how it looks. This is a three-dimensional, uh, not real life, this is kind of an artist's sketch. And what we see here, this is the three-dimensional patterns in the photoresist. This is the photoresist. 
Here it was illuminated, so it was removed. This is the line, this is the space. This is a, probably a contact, this is a line, and this is the line width, this is the space. And this is how, if everything goes well, this is how it should look. This is a kind of ideal structure of photoresist. And we have two types of resist. One is negative, where we illuminate it. The image is the opposite of the image. The wafer image is opposite of the mask image. The exposed resist hardens and it is insoluble. Typical negative resists are made of material similar to rubber. Rubber, natural rubber. When you illuminate it with UV, you have cross-linking of the polymer. The polymer is made of many chains inside the polymer. You illuminate it with UV, you cause cross-linking of the polymer. You harden the polymer, it becomes not soluble, insoluble. So when you remove it in developer, it removes only the unexposed resist. The light makes the resist unsoluble. Positive resist, the mask image, is the same as the wafer image. The exposed resist softens and is soluble, and the developer removes the exposed resist. Let me, this was in words, let, let's describe it again in pictures. If I take the mask, this is the glass mask, and the glass mask has some dark region on top of it. This can be metal, typical chromium, but also can be other metals. And this region is exposed, the black area is exposed. This area is unexposed. I put it in a developer, I insert it into the developer. The developer etches, removes all the photoresist which was not exposed. So I will get the photoresist as the black line here. So this is the photoresist. So this is the negative lithography. A positive photoresist, let's take this mask, but take the opposite mask. This mask is completely transparent here and opaque here. So only this area gets some light. So this area gets light and the light affects the properties of the photoresist. And I'm going to give you a little bit why later. So I, I put it in developer and this is what we get. Listen, the result here is the same as the result here. This is the negative resist and this is the positive resist. But in negative resist, I use a mask which is transparent on the side and opaque here. But here I use the negative mask to get the same result. So this is positive lithography and negative lithography. Again, to explain you a little more about the meaning of negative and positive, let's say I'm using the same mask. In, uh, sorry, I want to get, I want to generate this uh, cross. So I can, for the mass pattern required, uh, if I use a negative resist, this will be the mask. The mask will illuminate where I want the photoresist to stay. And if I'm using positive resist, this will be the mask. The, I illuminate where I want the positive, when I want the photoresist to be removed. So this is again the definitions and the meanings of negative and positive resist. As I showed you before, we can define dark field mask, we can define bright field mask. This is a, a mask with a clear field mask. We have opaque lines and structures. This is what we call a, a dark field mask, mostly holes. For example, this kind of mask is used when you want to open holes. Now let me tell you that most of the companies today use positive photoresist for high resolution. It happens that the positive photoresist gives better results in manufacturing. So people use a positive photoresist in most of the applications in silicon VLSI industry. However, if you deal with other industries, with MEMS industries or other technologies, uh, you can get quite a good uh, a negative photoresist and you can use them also. Yes? Uh, 
Uh, we, again, we have a special lecture how to clean resist. It's an art by itself. Uh, there are two ways to remove the resist. One is to buy a resist remover. Uh, some of the people in this room use uh, some solvents to remove nails. The, uh, not, no, sorry, not, so, to remove the nail polish, so not to remove the nails, I apologize, to remove the nail, to remove the polish, and you have a nail polish remover, which is a kind of, if you do the chemistry there, it's pretty nasty, it's very strong solvent. So we can buy some of the solvents, it's acetone is the easiest one, you can add the ketones, a methyl, a methyl isobutyl ketone, and other solvents are very useful in this, to remove photoresist. If it doesn't work, you have to burn it. Burn it. And I'm going to, in about lecture 10, I'm going to show you how to burn things in a very expensive equipment. You use plasma. You generate a plasma of gas, of oxygen, and you practically burn it in using oxygen ions. So I'm going to show you how you ignite a plasma in oxygen in a controlled way. And then if you put the polymer inside the plasma of oxygen, it practically burns. You convert carbon to CO2, which, is evap which evaporates, and you break the material. And if, if this doesn't work, uh, just throw away the wafer and change the process. <laughs> uh, not recommended, because uh, the lithography is a very ex expensive step and the light uh, can harden the polymer, it's not used. We don't illuminate it to remove it. It's too expensive, and uh, to do again this, the process, it's not cost-effective process, only in experiments or in the lab, but not in production. So let's go what we actually do. We calculated the image, but we need to do the actual lithography. So, first we take the substrate and we, and we need to deposit the photoresist, the light sensitive polymer on the substrate. But it's a big problem because many of the substrates, if you put polymer on top of them, you will have problem of adhesion. Uh, and if you look at the, if you paint the wall, sometimes after a few days or a few weeks, the paint can peel off of the wall. If there, there is something we call adhesion. Adhesion, if you put a thin polymer on a substrate, you want it to stick. Uh, many substrates uh, are oxidized. Silicon is slightly oxidized in air. Oxide is oxidized. If you work with uh, three, five uh, compounds, gallium arsenide, indium antimonide, they, ox they are oxidized. So many times, when you dip, if you work with glass, it's absolutely it's oxide. Now, oxide is hydrophilic. If you put oxide in air, it absorbs a little bit humidity from the air immediately. So if you put polymer on substrates, you always have a very thin layer of water between your polymer and the substrate, and it's a problem. So what we usually do and it's very common to prime the substrate, for example, HMDS, it's hexamethyldisilizan, it's one compound. And by the way, it's a very old trick that people in the glass blowing trade use. If you want to have a glass to blow glass and you want the glass to wet very nicely, you dip it in HMDS and then the glass becomes completely hydrophobic. Hydrophobic, then it does not absorb contamination. So it's interesting that on the substrate you put a material which makes the, it's like a water repellent. That's the similar material if you, if you buy new running shoes, if you want to run in the rain, you spray water repellent or in glasses. Because this material uh, repels water, prevents water absorption, However, if you put the next the photoresist, the photoresist contains solvents, which dissolves very nicely on this substrate. And the photoresist is 
typically coming as a liquid and you drop it on the surface and you spin the substrate very rapidly so the photoresist practically spread spreads over the substrate and it spreads very uniformly and you get very nice layer uh, next step you do the lithography after the lithography you do the next step is bake again to stabilize the photoresist uh, develop it remove it D develop is the process where you, rem you remove the, the areas which are illuminated in a positive photoresist and uh, you can bake it again you can see that we have se several bake step because it's a polymer polymer is a polymer so you need to bake it if you want to make it harder uh, so we have a lot of bake steps and then you inspect it it's very important to inspect to figure out this kind of uh, usually we don't use optic to inspect I'm going to tell you about inspections inspection later but we have to inspect it let's go very rapidly on the physics of the process the first uh, problem we see is how we spin photoresist photoresist is kind of a liquid that when you deposit it on the substrate the liquid dries away and leaves the polymer on the substrate so the faster you spin the substrate the thinner the photoresist so one if you spin it and I think I made a mistake in the speed it's factor 1000 too much so it's, this is 8000, 7000, 6000 uh, sorry uh, sorry this is with its thickness in angstrom so uh, this is um, this is 1 micron, 2 micron I think this is a little bit too much but what you see here is that if this is this uh, resist thickness versus spin speed and the faster the speed the thinner the photoresist how do you con can control the speed? you can dilute the photoresist and this is the same photoresist uh, you measure the viscosity of fluids by a unit called centipoise centipoise is a level of viscosity so this is the same polymer in a liquid with 110 centipoise, 70 and 21 and the, the way you do it, you take the polymer in a solvent and if you put more solvent, then it becomes less viscous so it's very easy to control viscosity of liquids and the thinner the photoresist it means you get, you have to dilute the photoresist and actually if some of you are working, and I know some of my students here we buy the photoresist, we buy the polymers but we, if, if we don't like what we buy, we can mix them with some solvent and make them less viscous, then they become thinner so it's something you can do in the lab and once you deposit the photoresist, what you care? you care about resolution, you care about contrast you care about sensitivity you care about viscosity, you care about adhesion next you care about etch resistance because after you do the lithography you do the etching you care about surface tension There's, if uh, surface tension is a problem because it um, affects the adhesion there are two other variables we, we don't think it's a big problem but it's a very big problem second is storage and handling it's a polymer you buy it from the supplier, you open it you expose it to air you use it, you close the bottle next student is coming, using it how do you know that after two or three weeks of use it's the same photoresist? it's changing, so what we do now, we don't do it we don't expose it to air we keep it in a stored liquid and we use a special pump to take the liquid from the bottle so storage and handling is very important parameters how do you know that you buy the photoresist from the same company and how do you know this is the same polymer? it may change, how do you trust them? now it's maybe not the role of this class to teach you how to do it but you have to be very careful when you buy photoresist because sometimes there might be some variations between bottles and this is, and this is I see here some graduate students, this is kind of not so much for the undergraduate but for the graduate student here which are using the material 
Uh, and good, but good companies today are actually delivering very reliable photoresist. And the last is contam contaminants and particles with a problem. So what is a photoresist? Now we reached the kind of the, the, the next 15 minutes. I will explain to you how do you, how do you make a photoresist. So this is just to show you, by the way, if you think about this class, last lecture was optics. Then we talked about tools. Then back to optics. Now the next 15 minutes is chemical engineering. So the, the nice thing about this lecture is it combines for many pieces of information from many disciplines. Overall, it is used to make process. And if you know the level that I'm explaining, it will allow you to design a very good process. And you know, the, if you know, the most important issue is to know what questions to ask. So I'm teaching you what questions to ask. Now, typical polymer, typical photoresist, is a, has three or four components inside. It's a polymer, and the polymer is dissolved in a solvent. So the first component is a solvent. And the solvent gives the photoresist the characteristics. I thought of bringing some of this material to the class, but because of safety issues, I decided not to do it. Photoresist can be a little bit toxic, so it's not so safe to bring it to class. We use it in a special chemical bench, especially because of the solvents. The solvents can be materials which are not so uh, friendly. We have to be very, uh, can be careful. The next is a resin. Resin is a mix of polymer that used uh, as a binder. This is the material that actually makes the structure of the photoresist. Now, the most common resin that we use in the industry today is a material called Novolac, uh, which you are all, you're all very familiar with it, but you don't know. It's a si very similar to what we call Formica. It's a almost the same family, it's a resin. I'm going to show the, chemical, the, chemi the, the, the chemistry of it, but if you think about it, it's a very hard polymer. But if you dissolve it in a liquid, it's a, it becomes a liquid. The next is the sensitizer. Sensitizer is a very interesting material. Sensitizer is a material that if you put it into a Novolac resin, if you put it with the Novolac, it makes the Novolac extremely stable. Very stable. So you take a Novolac, which is a hard polymer, and you put sensitizer or the, this material inside, it becomes very stable. However, this stabilizer is light sensitive. Which means, if you illuminate it with UV, you break it. You break it, and it, you break it in, in, into such condition that it practically disappears. Or most of it disappears. Now, because this material disappears, other material appears, and we, the nice of the chemistry here, that this material actually destroys the structure of the resin. They make it soluble. So this photosensitive formula, or this photosensitive material, if it's not illuminated, it stabilizes the structure. But when you illuminate it, you break it, and the result is soluble, and it's very easy to remove it. So this is called a uh, sensitizer, or um, photoactive compound, we call it. PAC, photoactive compound, or sensitizer. Uh, the red material, we call it additives. Additive is all these little things that the manufacturer never tells us about it. It's a surfactant, it's materials that makes the spinning more nice, um, the photos is stable, helps the storage, and because it's a polymer, so there's some additives that manufacturers put into the polymer and make, make it a better product. So material which is sensitive or sensitizer, we call it PAC. PAC is photoactive compound. This is a special compo component that we put inside. 
that when we have this component, the structure is stable. When this component reacts with light, it, destro it is destroyed, and the product of the reaction actually destroys the structure. It's an acid. The result, it's a material which is stable, but when you illuminate it, it breaks and generates acid, and the acid makes the whole structure soluble. But only where we illuminate. So if we look at this structure, the unexposed resist containing PAC places or for, uh, for the polymer, when you have PAC, it's very, very stable. It's actually a stabilizer. It stabilizes the structure. It's a very interesting molecule. And by the way, this is a very old patent. The patent of these uh, uh, polymers is almost 100 years old. And the sensitizer, or this molecule which reacts with light, it's also close to 100 years old. It's, very, it's, a, it's, a, it's a known chemistry. It's a chemistry of photopolymers, which is known for almost 100 years. But it became commercially available as a product maybe 50 years ago. Or I don't know the, the exact dates, but it's, it's not a new chemistry. But then if you look inside, uh, very, very carefully, this is the pre-exposed resist. It's very stable. <coughs> if you look very, very carefully here, we have PAC in the structure, and the pre-exposed photoresist is very, very stable. Now, let's look at this mask. I illuminate, and this area in the center is illuminated. And this area uh, is not illuminated. Now, the, we have regions which are illuminated. This area is illuminated. This area, the light breaks the photoactive compound, destroys it. Not only destroys it, but it somehow breaks it, and it's made from a molecule that when you break it, you generate some acid. By the way, uh, just a comment, in, this reaction requires a little bit humidity in the air. And so if you go to our clean rooms, if you go to fabrication sites, you will notice that the air inside is not dry. It has like 45% humidity. This is common. If you do this experiment in a dry environment, you will not get lithography. It's at least in this type of photoresist. So look what happens. This area was exposed to light. It's no, there is no photoactive compound. This area is very soluble. This area, we have the photoactive compound. Now think about it. This, we, here we have light, here there is no light, but if you remember, there is some transition region between full light to no light, which depends on the slope of the contrast, of the MTF, of the modulation transfer function. So the steeper the slope, the, more, the better is the definition between illuminated to not illuminated. So the contrast, or the slope of the light intensity defines which side is illuminated, which side is not. So the next step, I, dev I put it in a, in a, the resist exposed to light dissolves in the, in the developer, we, de we, we dip it in a developer, and if you look very carefully, the developer removes all the photoresist from this region and keeps the photoresist here. By the way, since uh, for this specific uh, uh, compound, the light generates acid. The most common way to etch acid is to dip it in a base, like KOH or sodium hydroxide or tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide. You take some base, a strong base. Base reacts with acid, generates salt. Salt is soluble, goes, goes out. So this is a little bit chemistry, a little bit chemical engineering, but on a very basic level. Uh, modern photoresist, what people do use now, use some trick. Since we know that when we break the sensitizer, we generate acid, and the acid makes the structure soluble, what people do is they did a trick. 
They put another compound inside that generates acid when you illuminate it independently. But this molecule has like a trigger. In order to generate acid, this molecule needs acid. So it's kind of positive feedback mechanism. So we call this chemically amplified deep UV resist and they generate, they, they include a company we call PAG, photoactive generator. This molecule not only breaks and generates in, the, in this structure, every molecule of the synthesizer generates one hydrogen, one proton, one molecule of acid. Here, this photoactive compound generates, every molecule generates a lot of protons, a lot of acids, so we got much stronger signal. This is kind of amplification. We call it chemical amplification. I know that for you, for, from your point it doesn't matter, it's just, uh, the fact is it makes the photoresist more nonlinear. Or we have some amplification, so the photoresist is also more sensitive. So now because the photoresist every molecule generates few uh, molecules of acid, we can illuminate in weaker light, so we don't need strong light, or we can run faster. So this is what we use today. Today we use photoresist with chemically amplified resist. And if you just a little bit for chemistry, the resin is a phenolic copolymer. Some of you are not familiar with ex what exactly is phenolic copolymer, but it's a polymer which is unsoluble in developer. The photoactive generator generates acid during exposure. The, ac the acid generated in exposed resist area serves as a catalyst for remove resin protective group, which makes, in other words, you illuminate, you generate acid, the acid destroys the photoresist, and then you can remove it. So this is the photoresist. So what so this was this was like 10 minutes on chemistry, but this is about it. We're not going much deeper. But I want you to understand the interaction with light now. We have one part of the equation. We have light, we have the modulation transfer function, and we have the response of the photoresist. So what, first, what do we want from the photoresist? We want to be well-defined, with sharp walls, no swelling. Swelling is these properties of polymer that if you put them in liquid, they tend to absorb fluid from the side and to expand. And also have good contrast, but I have to define to you what is the contrast of a photoresist. So first, the optical image that we calculated before, in the previous lecture we calculated the optical image, which means we calculated the light intensity. It has to interact with the photoresist. The photoresist includes matrix, which is the resin, the hard, hard part, the solvent, and the photoactive compound, which this is the special compound that stabilizes the structure, makes the structure stable, but when we illuminate it, it actually makes the structure soluble. So how do we model it? So if we assume that the concentration of the photoactive compound is we, 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 we write it as a small letter M. M is the actual concentration. But we, we normalize it, which means initially it's equal to 1, so M is concentration at the time t divided by concentration at time 0. So initially the, the, the large M is equal to 1. After we illuminate for a long time, M goes to 0. So M is the concentration of the photoactive compound. This is exactly a very nice lecture. I teach you chemistry without knowing chemistry. Because you are engineers, you understand equations. So I wrote, I wrote it in equation mode, without going to the chemistry. Which is actually an interesting idea. And I illuminate it with energy D. D is how many watts per centimeter square. This is the energy of the light. So I in watts, the intensity. And T is the exposure time. Now, uh, what we find out is that we can define a dose. Dose is the energy. What is energy? Energy is power times time. Power in watts, the light intensity in watts, multiplied by the time, 
if I illuminate with one watt of energy of light for one second, it is one joule. So the dose or the energy is the intensity times time. What we find out that the concentration of the photoactive compound is not a function of the intensity, is not a function of time, it's a function of the energy, which actually makes sense because if you hit with a lot, many photons for short time or for small number of photons for long time, it will be the same effect. What counts is the number of photons and every photon has a certain amount of energy. So I calculate, if I look at the total intensity, the, with the total M, M is actually a function of the dose, the amount of energy that is being deposited. So if I calculate the concentration of M, M is the amount of the photoactive compound. If I calculate how, what is the rate of destruction, because I start with a, photo, with a lot of photoactive compound, I illuminate the photoresist, and then I destroy it. So the amount of destruction of the photoactive compound depends on the amount of light. More light, destruction is faster. But it's also a function of M. And the reason is, let's say you have 1,000 molecules. In every second you destroy 1%. If you have 1,000 molecules, you destroy 10. If you have 1 million molecules, you destroy 10,000. So the relative destruction depends on the amount of the population. So the amount of destruction of the photoactive compound, M, depends on amount of, photo, of, of photoactive compound, light intensity, and a constant that we call C. It's a constant. The next equation is what is the intensity of the light inside the photoresist. So now we are back to optics. If you look at lights hitting matter, we know the absorption of light depends on the coefficient of the absorption of the matter. And the absorption of the matter, it's called alpha, but in our case, uh, alpha is more complicated. Alpha is the, absor is the level of absorption of the material, how much the material absorbs light. And it depends also on the amount of light itself. Again, if we have if every, every distance we absorb 1%, if the light intensity is 1, we absorb 1.01. If we have 10 times more light, we absorb 10 times more. If, if, the, if the light is 10 times stronger, we absorb 10 times more light, because the amount of light that we absorb depends on how much hits the specific position in the material. But what we find out is that the, absorb, the, absorb, the absorption amount of the polymer depends on, there is some constant, we call it B, but it also depends on the amount of the photoactive compound. So these are the two equations. Uh, di over dx. Ah, this is uh, this is the amount of destruction per unit time, and di over dx is the light decay. X is the distance from the surface. Sorry, I should have mentioned. I would like to measure the intensity of light and the amount of photoactive compound as a function of distance from the surface, and as a function of time. Initially, M is equal 1 all over. Sorry? It should be big M. There's a typo here. It should be a big M. Correct. What we got? We got two equations, two partial equations linked, nonlinear, that if we know how to solve them, we actually can solve this problem of lithography. Because I... And on the surface of the photoresist is given by the optics. I, inside the photoresist, is the solution of this equation. M is the solution of this equation. But I depends on M and I. And M depends on I and M, nonlinearly. So it's a set of nonlinear equations. And in the last minute, I'm going to show a very simple, let's say, that 
let's say, photoresist with a constant absorption, no independent of time. If a con this is a constant, I neglect this factor, I go to this equation, if uh, intensity is independent of time, we got dm over dt is constant times m, and the solution, if you know that this, is, this becomes a, a first order equation, the solution is exponential. The interesting enough, this is the solution m as a function of t is e minus cit. If I take uh, this solution, I can play a lot with it, and uh, I can calculate m, I can calculate i, and I think we are running out of time. It's 8 o'clock now, so we'll continue with lithography next week. Thanks.